It is my honor to be the chairman of the last session. I propose that we we'll, uh, start already. And the first speaker of the session is Professor Kios, so one of the first professors working at the Center for Technical Physics. So, professor, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. I am in such a good situation that I don't need to tell you the story of my life because uh, I was studying in the same group as uh, Łukasz Turski, so he already told you this our story, including the people who were <coughs> who influenced us most, namely Professor Bielinicki, together with his a bit younger brother, uh, Stepan, Andrzej Stepan, and also Professor Czarna. Today I'm, I'm going to tell you a, a very old story. This, uh, my talk has a subtitle, which I will explain in the sequel. So it is about, in quotation mark, Quant uh, quantization of time. So, there have been many papers when I was um, a PhD student, say, I read many papers uh, where people were, were lamenting that <laughs> why do we quantize only three variables if there are four of them? This Papers were mostly uh, very poorly uh, based, both from physical and mathematical side. Uh, very often, the uncertainty principle between energy and time were used to claim the existence of the time operator fulfilling commutation relation with the Hamilton operator. But already in early 50s, there was a comment by Wolfgang Pauli that no such operator exists if the Hamiltonian operator has spectrum bounded from below. Otherwise, there were only purely formal comments about the appearance of the above mathematical formulas. In early 70s, together with Lech Stanisław Voronowicz and myself, we had many discussions with Ivo Białyński Birula concerning fundamental structures of quantum mechanics, and we got a lot, a lot of inspirations from those uh, discussions. Personally, I have been trying to decipher this puzzling time-energy uncertainty principle. As soon as I felt that I have understood a little, Professor Bialinski encouraged me to present this result as my habilitation thesis, which I did in 73, which means that the story is really very old, mainly 50 years old. It soon appears in reports on mathematical physics under this stupid name uh, on the time operator. Okay, but there was a, a, almost 100 papers with that time, uh, with that title, time operator, then I followed this, this uh, terminology. Initially, the response was not great, but later there was a great response, and especially there have been two papers which were published more than uh, 20 years later, which I, which I missed, roughly speaking, because I I was thinking that the problem is already solved and there is no interest in that. However, these two papers were pointed to me by Krzysztof Wutkiewicz, who told me, ah, you should read. 
Both cited my paper, but both uh, claimed that my solution was wrong. And uh, I immediately noticed that the second paper by, by Muga was totally wrong, from both from uh, physical and mathematical point of view, whereas Rovelli's paper simply repeated my result in different terminology. Then I tried to publish a response, which finally was published. However, at the beginning, Muga was uh, highly pro protesting, but it was not very difficult to convince the editor that he was not uh, right, whereas uh, Carlo Rovelli immediately recognized that, yes, indeed, they have uh, reproduced my result. Very soon, Muga was converted, and she became a great prophet of my theory, to such an extent that he published a huge paper, or even a, we can call it a book in uh, physics reports, where he explains the story. This time it was correct. Okay, so the starting point is, what sense can be assigned to time as a physical observable? Of course, space-time coordinates are certainly not observables. They three of them become uh, observables once we fix time as a classical parameter. So these observables measure uh, coordinates of the point where the particle trajectory hits the hypersurface T equal constant. So my idea was, let us replace time variable and position, which means that x is now a classical parameter, and these three observables measure coordinates of a point where the particle trajectory hits the hypersurface x equal constant. So this was beginning of the story. Example, if we have a free particle, then trajectories are described by this equation, whereas momentum is uh, conserved. And in order to get a formula for this time operator, in quotation mark, or time observable, we simply have to solve, the, to fix uh, the position of this window and to solve this equation with respect to t, which is trivial. Now, this is particle's position, actual position at, say, x equals zero, whereas this x is a window's position, so this is a purely classical parameter. Of course, this addition, uh, this, um, it is very easy to shift the uh, coordinate system in such a way that the um, uh, coordinate x is measured from this window. Therefore, the, our task is to, in quotation mark, qu quantize, quantize such a um, classical observer. And of course, this is a purely one-dimensional problem. So roughly speaking, this is this observable, which has to be quantized. Now, if we know how to quantize position and momentum, the question arises how to quantize the quotient. Is such a quantization possible? Is it unique? My uh, 73 approach was entirely axiomatic. I have analyzed properties of the probability density. So x, remember, is a classical parameter which tells you where this window has been situated. 
and this probability density were uh, when integrated over a two-dimensional window and over a one-dimensional uh, time interval gives a probability that the particle will pass through this window within this um, inter interval of time. As a mathematical tool to analyze this problem, I have also introduced th this wave function. Again, x was a purely classical parameter and so on, such that the probability was equal to the square modulus, square of the modulus of this wave function. Today I'm going to show you the same result, the same story in a completely different geometrical context, which is, I believe, much, much simpler and very nice. And this is why I took the liberty of borrowing the subtitle of my talk from Spinoza, demonstrated in geometric order. OK, so about quantization. In, in uh, most textbooks of uh, quantum mechanics, people say that the very origin of quantum mechanics is, uh, is Heisenberg um, commutation relation, and the quantization simply consists in replacing C numbers by, the, by Q numbers, and so on and so on. And this works perfectly for harmonic oscillator. And I was young when I was studying at the University of Warsaw. <laughs> One of the things which was mostly repeated by the teacher of physics was that due to this discovery of Heisenberg, we know that the ground state of the harmonic oscillator has non-zero energy. <coughs> Later on, when I started to work in quantum field theory, and I read Dirac, Heisenberg, Weisskopf, and those people uh, claim that what is field? Uh, what is field? Field is just a co collection of many harmonic oscillators. How many? Infinitely many. Therefore, the ground state of the field would be infinite. And then I only I realized that this additional constant in the uh, Hamiltonian is absolutely non-physical because the physics takes place not, not in Hilbert space, but in um, projective Hilbert space. So because, and the global phase of the vector uh, has no physical meaning. So this Heisenberg approach is per works perfectly for harmonic oscillator, but otherwise it is meaningless. What are those two numbers? And how to divide a Q number by another Q number. And nowadays we know that two more ingredients are necessary to give any meaning to the Heisenberg uh, proposal. Those two ingredients are, first of all, Hilbert space. When I was young, there was a branch of mathematics which was called uh, quantum logics. And those people were trying to prove that Hilbert space is necessary, that it comes from some physical uh, properties. And they failed. No. But nevertheless, even if we already know that these are operators in Hilbert space, the negating doesn't, it is not sufficient because we immediately realize that those operators cannot be bounded, and therefore the commutativity of non-bounded operators is a very subtle subject, and only after a couple of years of the, um, mathematical research 
in the 20s and 30s, people realized that this commutational relation must be understood in a strong sense, which is by no means um, implied by physics. Okay, later on it, uh, the same story happened with Hopf algebras, which when treated on purely algebraic level, lead to nothing. And you really need a lot of functional analysis to give any sense. To okay, so I claim that <coughs> the very uh, found foundations of uh, quantum uh, mechanics and quantum physics comes not from Heisenberg uncertainty relations, but from Schrodinger equation, where we have wave function with probabilistic interpretation. Now, this probabilistic interpretation, of course, because, uh, we know that at the beginning, uh, Schrodinger tried to give the hydrodynamic interpretation to this quantity. This is a very important quantity because it fulfills um, continuity equation. But unfortunately, it spreads all of, uh, the space. Therefore, uh, Max Born proposed this uh, probabilistic interpretation. Once we know it, we already realize that PT is therefore a spectral resolution of the self adjoint operators acting in the Hilbert space. So all this mathematical framework comes immediately just from Schrodinger equation. Now, what about momentum? Momentum doesn't come from this very complicated mathematically implementation of the uh, Heisenberg uh, relation, but may be simply derived within this framework. For this pur purpose, we may use the classical formula, which is valid for any statistical ensemble of classical free particles with mass m, which means that if we have a uh, my probability distribution, but not in uh, uh, space, nor in, uh, uh, but on the en entire phase space, whereas probability distribution uh, in the configuration space and in the momentum space are given as appropriate marginals, then this formula is true. We simply measure probability in the configuration space in different times, and this formula gives you immediately the probability in the momentum space. The rho of t of R p is positive. Defined. It's not defined. Not defined. Yeah, it is not. No, no, but in this uh, classical case, it is defined. No, no, I say this formula is valid in uh, classical statistical physics. And now we take this formula as granted and we plug the uh, Schrodinger's definition for, uh, for the probability distribution in position space. And we close our eyes, we stop thinking, we calculate, and we get this result. This is simply a result. So the momentum, <coughs> and we immediately recognize that this formula provides the spectral resolution of, cell, of a self-adjoint of self-adjoint operators, px, and so on, which is which are defined this way in momentum representation, which simply means that when translated to the position representation, they have this. Okay. The only textbook in quantum mechanics, which I know, which introduces um, momentum in such a way, I would say in a decent way, and not just by those 
crazy postulate is the book by Bialinski, Virula, Cieplak, and Kamiński. I know uh, the Polish version from Feynman. Means Feynman who gave this argument. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. I don't claim we invented it. Now, what about other uh, observables? Can we <laughs> also uh, quantize them? So, momenta are only examples of functions which are linear in momenta. So, let us concentrate for a while on such uh, observables which are linear in momenta. So, the coefficients have a natural interpretation of uh, vector fields in the configuration space. When we have a vector field, it generates locally a group of diffeomorphisms, which can be used to transport locally wave functions. Now, if this group is global and not local, but global, that means if the field is complete, this transport is, uh, by definition, uh, unitary. It is a unitary transformation. Now, I have used a different letter because now here I put not just a scalar function, but a half density. This strange invention, at least it could look strange for you, comes from the fact that the scalar product is defined this way, but this measure, this 3x, is absolutely um, strange for it has nothing to do with those quantum states. Therefore, in order to avoid a uh, strange object, it uh, pays to marry half of them with each of those functions and to consider such a uh, half density. Now, if uh, we have a group of unitary transformations, then it is necessarily uh, of this type, and this f hat uh, is called a uh, Lie derivative of this, of this uh, half density. Now, uh, so in terms of uh, calculations, we have to act the, with this V derivative of, on this product. Of course, we know how to uh, uh, the V derivative when acting on a scalar function, it is just a derivative, but we also have to act on this uh, half density. Um, This is a uh, divergence, one half of the, the divergence. So if we collect these uh, results, we might naively deduce that ah, it is very simple. In order to quantize that, we simply quantize this and that, and we take a scalar product. But such a statement is totally false because in order to uh, this formula to have any mathematical meaning, this field must be complete, which means that this transport must be global. And if it is, uh, and this uh, criterion is by no means uh, algebraic. Now, let me tell something about this in a pedestrian way. So, given a vector field, we can find coordinates in which this field is d over ds. Of course, locally it is always possible, but if the field is globally uh, contact, then, then. And in these coordinates, we simply put what we have learned from Schrodinger, 
how to quantize Hamiltonian example. X times P. Of course, this field is global because it generates a group of homotety, and it is very easy to find this um, coordinate S, namely, S is logarithm of X. Therefore, our Psi, which originally looked like that, nowadays, and now we have to act to uh, take a derivative not only of the original wave function, but also of this uh, factor coming from half density. And this way, indeed, this formula is um, uh, correct, which means that the, the right-hand side is um, essentially an essentially self-adjoint operator. Yeah. Now, now observe that Fourier transformation corresponds to canonical transformation where x becomes momentum and momentum becomes minus x. Therefore, our time operator, because minus x is momentum, in momentum representation should be written this way. So it is very easy to find a coordinate uh, such that x is d over de, and this is precisely the uh, kinetic energy. Unfortunately, this is not global because it covers only positive piece. In order to have a global coordinate, we could, for example, take S equal energy for positive P and minus energy. But in this coordinates, X is D over DS for positive S and minus D over DS for negative S. Therefore, those two half lines uh, decouple and uh, this is a momentum uh, operator on a half line. It is, uh, it has no self-adjoint uh, extension, and therefore uh, the, we see that uh, an attempt to quantize this quantity is a nonsense, which is nothing but the uh, pedestrian way to prove that Wolfgang Pauli was right, roughly speaking, that there is not such an operator. And just uh, let me only uh, sketch briefly what was my uh, idea. I, let, let us take uh, an operator which is t for p equals zero, let me call it right movers, and minus t for the left movers. This technique is very similar to the newton wigner construction of the position operator in a relativistic uh, quantum mechanics were the up movers, which means particles, and down movers, which means antiparticles, are considered uh, separately. And now this uh, new operator has this expression and uh, this momentum has this nice uh, uh, feature that it, this is a, just a, uh, uh, a complete vector field and in this uh, coordinates t is just h over i d over ds and I will probably stop here because my time is over. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now we have time for one or two questions. Yes. The problem with all these constructions is that they do not work in relativistic physics. 
in the relativistic physics, the position operator, let's take an electron, cannot be defined because relativity brings in additional constraints. And that is why I doubt very much that using just non-relativistic physics, one can gain and the insights into the problem of the position and time upgrade. I agree with that. <laughs> yeah, but there was a problem, and mathematically this problem has been solved, and I also doubt in the physical side of this problem. <laughs> When you, when you gave credit to Ivo in the book, you had this formula, t to the cube is psi, times psi absolute value squared x minus et, going over into the momentum distribution. So if you go back, if you want to see it back. So there was a formula, and you said, and there was, Ivo said, oh, they came really from Feynman. You mean? This classical formula. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. In the book by Feynman and Hibbs. Yeah, yeah, yeah but, but this is a no, no, no. Very yeah, yeah, yeah. This formula. The formula. This is just if you give it to undergraduate student, he will immediately find this formula. The next one. I'm still a little bit surprised about TQ. See, I'm surprised to find TQ there. Why is it TQ? Hmm? It's the volume element. You get a T squared from in general, and then you get a volume element from T. Is that it? See, I, find, I remember there's a similar formula for Wigner functions. You can see that the distribution for long times Looking from the Wigner function, you propagate this forward, and then you just do the yeah, transformation. Yeah, because the Wigner function behaves uh, at least for uh, uh, quadratic uh, Hamiltonians, yeah, yeah. which yeah, yeah. behaves classically and uh, behaves precisely like like this classical problem. Yeah. But some yeah, other the TQ. I have to check this. Have the same you? formula for you. Do we have other questions? Yes. So uh, you somehow distinguish this x coordinate while constructing this t because you said you need to take three yeah. to have the form. Oh, but but this is a bit a bit artificial. I mean, usually I would think about time operator that you define it once you give some region in space that you ask what is the probability distribution of particle arriving in this region of space and in this way define the operator. And maybe I can uh, ask because Krzysztof Saha is here. I understand that they had a few years ago a paper with Lorenzo Macone on this time of arrival operator more in this spirit and also using this generalized measurement, not necessarily focusing on, on like uh, projective measurement, like, like, like the observables. As, as you do, but using this more general approach to measurement without necessarily thinking of observables. Yeah, but I don't know how to uh, how to describe. No, I agree. This is just a different setting. My setting was fix a uh, uh, hypersurface, whether t equal constant or x equal constant. But you can perfectly repeat the similar approach to. Uh, such hypersurfaces in space-time, and th then there is a probability density for, uh, given a three-dimensional region on this hypersurface. There is, we, we are in, interested in describing the probability that the particle trajectory will hit this hypersurface within this three-dimensional region. So, yeah, but. What you propose is a different setting, and I don't know how to solve it. I propose that we we'll thank the speaker again.